everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Today we do an introduction to Temporal's architecture session. I am Dominic Torno. I'm a principal engineer at Temporal and I will guide you through this journey today. What is Temporal? Temporal is both a runtime and a set of SDKs for building durable, reliable, and scalable distributed applications with an unparalleled developer experience. Now, Temporal's core abstraction is the workflow execution. But what is a workflow execution? So to build an intuition of a successful core abstraction, let's first look at database transactions. What is a database transaction? A transaction is a sequence of operations, or more specifically, a sequence of read and write operations that is guaranteed to terminate with either commit or abort. Now that gives us the guarantee that a database transaction executes not at all or once to completion. The guarantee once to completion gives us a possibility, gives us a tool to transition our application from one valid state to the next valid state, since there cannot be only partial application. It is either all or nothing. Do we have a similar abstraction in the context of distributed systems? Well, now we do. Let's start with the classical function execution. We can argue that a function is the smallest building block we have at our disposal to compose large scale complex systems. So a function is again, it's a sequence of uh, steps, but a classical function execution is not durable. It's not reliable and it's not inherently scalable. Function executions usually have time limits. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, five minutes, 15 minutes. Whatever the time limit may be, there is a time limit. Function executions are inherently not reliable. They are sensitive to failure. If your environment fails, your function execution will fail and that may lead to partial application. And they are not inherently scalable. They may be sensitive to load. Let's contrast that with a workflow execution. What is a workflow execution? A workflow execution is a function, a function execution, but with stronger execution guarantees. A workflow execution is durable, it is reliable, and it is scalable. It doesn't have an inherent time limit. It is inherently oblivious to fail. Eh? And it's inherently oblivious to load. Now, a classical function execution, therefore, doesn't give any execution guarantees. Right? As we said, there is a, there is a pol possibility of partial execution. The function execution started, yet it did not complete, and um, it fails, it crashes, it stops. The difference to the workflow execution is that the workflow execution is guaranteed to execute once to completion. Again, once to completion. So with that, now we do have an abstraction for distributed systems that allows us to successfully transition our system from one valid state to the next valid state. So just imagine you can write workflows like that, like a workflow to convert a user from a free user to paid user. You send the user an email, you greet them. You sleep for 30 days. And then you send the uh, user an email, ask them to sign up. 
This is guaranteed on temporal to execute once to completion. Now let's look at different workflow execution engines. What is there? What's available? And what are their consequences, advantages, disadvantages? There are generally two types of workflow execution engines. There's state-based workflow execution engines, and there is log-based workflow execution engines. State-based workflow execution engines retain the current execution state by persisting the execution point and the current environment. Whereas log-based workflow execution engines retain the current execution state by recreating the execution point in the environment. So a state-based workflow execution engine persists what we can call the program counter and the variables. Whereas a log-based execution engine persists individual commands, the steps of the workflow and their results in order to use that to recreate the program counter and the current variables. Let's go through two examples. So first off, I didn't feel super creative today. So we have a very simple uh, workflow that consists of three steps, three activities, foo, bar, and buzz. And foo will return A, bar will re uh, return B, and buzz will return C. So I want to mention, I want to direct your attention to two different concepts. Usually we say workflow, but we actually need to either talk about the workflow definition or the workflow execution. That's uh, similar to in object-oriented languages, the relationship between class and uh, object. So an invocation uh, turns a definition into an execution. We can therefore say that generally definitions are the generators of executions, or the other way around, we can say that executions are the instances of uh, definitions. So let's walk through a state-based execution. So for a state-based execution engine, it's very typical that we have a graphical environment, something like BPMN. So here we have three steps, full bar, bus. These uh, graphical notations are meant for human consumption. The machine, of course, is presented with some kind of encoding here, some uh, JSON. So um, the languages are domain specific. They're domain specific for the workflow execution engine. Most of the time, they either resemble something like state machines and transitions, or they resemble flows. But again, that is completely up to the workflow execution engine. So here, this is, looks more state-based. So we have three different states. Each state specifies um, the activities. So we have the first uh, in the first state, for example, the activity um, foo and it specifies the um, next state number two and so on and so forth until number uh, two then specifies the next state is three and three is an end state. <clears throat> so on invocation, yeah, the workflow engine instantiates that workflow definition, turns it into a workflow execution and activates, meaning it yields control to the computation that is specified by the workflow um, definition, it yields control to the workflow execution. So we have the first activation. In the first activation, we didn't start yet, right? So uh, we look into the workflow execution engine and see that our starting state is state one. Therefore, we can argue transitioning to state one is the second activation. Now in state one, we will find an activity foo. So we will yield control back to the workflow engine, requesting to execute activity foo. Activity foo will be executed and returns um, value A. So here the workflow engine persists current state, that is one, and our current environment, 
current environment in these workflow engines, it's usually global, but again, it's up to the workflow engine, but there's usually no scoping. We usually call that the workflow execution document and each step is allowed to add to that document. So here we have uh, the first activity being executed. So the first uh, value in our document is A. Now for the third activation, we basically see the uh, repetition here. Now our environment uh, grows from A and B and we have the current state uh, being two. And then the final activation three. Uh, so we have the, we, we persist the state three and we persist the entire environment. Okay, these are the state-based workflow execution engines. They are usually highly limited in their expressiveness because first off, we need to be able uh, to persist the current state, the program counter, and we need to be able to persist all of the environments, usually in a flat scope. And uh, the control flow that you can express is therefore also limited. It's limited by the DSL, by the domain specific language. Let's have a look at log-based execution engines and specifically temporal. How does that look like? Well, in the context of temporal, uh, you are free to use one of our SDKs to write any code. This here in particular is um, pseudocode uh, to basically symbolize that you can write that either in Java, in Golang, PHP, JavaScript, TypeScript, you choose one of our SDKs, but you see the, uh, the gist of it is normal code. We write normal code as we would write for any function definition. And here we execute three activities and we, as, uh, we assign all of these activity results, we assign those to local variables and then uh, return all of these local variables. So once again, when we call uh, when we invoke, so when we invoke a workflow definition, our system um, instantiates a workflow definition to a workflow execution. Similar as before, we will have a look at the individual activations. So the first activation, when we step through the code, we will hit the uh, first statement in our code, await execute activity foo. That will result in a command uh, foo. And uh, we will now await on the await point. Since we do not have a result yet for the command foo, we yield control back to the workflow engine with the request, execute the activity foo for us. Here for temporal, we will also terminate that particular workflow function execution. The workflow engine temporal then goes ahead and uh, orchestrates the execution of activity foo, yielding to a return value, A, leading to our second activation. Here we see the replay semantics of the log-based execution engine. We will start our uh, workflow from the very beginning. We will again evaluate the first statement However, now the difference is that we actually already have a value for foo. So we can assign that return value already to the local variable um, foo uh, uh, depicted at the bottom with the, the local environment. And now we hit the second statement, await executive activity bar. Therefore we schedule the command bar. And once again, we do not have a value yet. Therefore, we need to yield control back to the uh, to temporal to the workflow engine. Temporal will orchestrate the execution of the activity for us. And once um, we have a return value for that activity, it will once again um, activate our workflow execution, which means we will execute the workflow function execution from the very beginning. Again, uh, we already have a value for foo. Now we have a value for bar and we repeat that yet again for bus. Therefore, once again, we don't have a value. Temporal will um, orchestrate the um, execution of the activity for us. Once we have a value, uh, Temporal will again activate our workflow execution. And once again, we will start from the very beginning, execute foo, we have the value, execute bar, we have the value, execute bus, we have the value and now, 
we can conclude our workflow execution. Now to the conclusion. We see that um, a workflow execution is a sequence of steps, like a function execution is a sequence of steps. However, a workflow execution has a stronger execution guarantees. That is, it guarantees once execution to completion. With that guarantee, it is much easier to build applications that transition from one valid state to the next valid state. There are generally two ways of implementing um, workflow executions or implementing the abstraction of a workflow execution. There is state-based and there is log-based. State-based workflow executions engines uh, need to uh, utilize DSLs and DSLs uh, limit your um, expressivity. There is a limit in the control flow you can express. There is a limit in the error handling you can express. However, log-based um, engines like Temporal, they do not have that limitation as you can write your workflows, uh, your workflow ex um, definitions with the help of our SDKs in any language. Therefore, you have the entire control flow of that language to your disposal, all scoping rules of variables um, to uh, your disposal, um, exception handling to uh, your disposal. And depending on the language, the concurrency primitives, Java, it's threats and Golang, it's uh, uh, go routines to your disposal. That is um, temporal allows you to write code and get workflow executions. Now with that, I would like to uh, open up for Q&A, but I also have uh, one request that is, if you do not uh, mind, uh, I'll drop a link for a, a quick feedback form into our chat. It's only two questions. So if you don't mind casually navigating to that link and uh, filling out the feedback form, that would be super nice, super appreciated. And uh, yeah, as I said, we open this for question. Let me stop sharing. Oh, no. Only by only by the temporal being foiled by I Google realize. Forms. That um, is unfortunate. Can I duplicate this somehow? Let me see. We do have questions. I have a question. What is the difference? One second, what is the difference between a workflow and an activity? Is an activity sometimes a workflow? So uh, you can, the way I like to think about it is that the uh, um, workflow is the orchestrator and the activity is the executor. So activities are uh, from the point of view of the workflow atomic steps and they are um, uh, they are meant to encapsulate arbitrary I.O. You saw the uh, replay feature. In order to uh, be able to successfully implement the uh, replay feature, we rely on uh, what is uh, what uh, we uh, term determinism. Our workflow functions need to be deterministic. That is why arbitrary I.O., which is inherently uh, non-deterministic, is... Um, uh, is executed in the context of activities. That way, uh, Temporal can balance the need of being deterministic to uh, replay the, the workflow um, execution, but also giving you the possibility to execute arbitrary I.O. Okay, I'll provide a voice to the follow-up question. Um, Matt Zandi says, if I understand correctly, activities don't time out. What happens if one takes forever? So uh, you do have, uh, you do have uh, multiple possibilities there. 
So for the activity execution, uh, Temporal has an extensive uh, um, uh, retry policy. So you can um, limit the execution time of activities, but you do not have to. Um, if activities are um, unlimited in execution time or have a very long execution time, we do strongly recommend, strongly, that you implement heart beating because that lets Temporal know that the activity is uh, still alive. If the activity is uh, basically crashed, uh, yet you do not, you do not have um, any timeout uh, mechanisms, then it may be very hard for a distributed system like Temporal to detect that your activity is no longer running. So you're correct, activities do not have to have any timeouts. Um, however, we strongly recommend do heartbeat to let Temporal know that your activity is actually still running. Because if it is not running, then our uh, retry policy takes over and uh, Temporal will, depending on your configuration, either reschedule or let the workflow know that the activity failed. Thanks for the example. Uh, Max, um, has so we have one more question. So what about composing workflows? How does it look in a workflow when you want to execute another workflow? Is that just something that would be wrapped in an activity? No, you would not wrap that in an activity generally. Um, even so, you do have that possibility. However, there is uh, the um, mechanism of parent-child uh, workflow. So if you want to call a workflow, uh, or schedule a workflow from another workflow, then uh, we recommend to use uh, the parent-child relationship because that also gives you uh, um, visibility in the uh, in the parent. So you can you can wait for uh, for example you can wait for either the child workflow being started or uh, most of the time uh, you can wait for the child workflow being completed. And that way it is very straightforward to implement fan out, fan in um, patterns and scenarios. Let's suppose you want to schedule workflow to run weekly. Is it possible to set a custom uh, start time? There are, again, multiple uh, possibilities. Uh, Tempora is very flexible. For uh, one, we do have cron workflows, where you have a cron expression, and then uh, workflow um, um, execution starts on the uh, cron expression. However, cron expression is fairly static, right? So, um, however, there, there may be scenarios where you need um, a very flexible uh, scheduling where you basically calculate the delta. How long uh, should the how long should the uh, delta from one workflow execute time delta from one workflow execution to the another workflow execution actually be? And in that case, um, the the typical pattern is you have a coordination workflow that is basically a parent. The parent calculates uh, timing requirements, calculates uh, deltas, offset, and so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, sleeps for the for the uh, necessary duration and starts uh, child workflows. With that, you are super flexible in in building your uh, your own um, custom scheduling. If your scheduling is more straightforward, and a lot of it is, if your scheduling is more straightforward, then temporal cron workflows are for you. How does Temporal deal with workflows involving continuous change? For example, workflows not designed to end, but whose state must adapt to ongoing changes in input. So um, workflow executions can capture processes with a defined beginning and a defined ending. But um, uh, Nathan is entirely correct. Workflows can also uh, capture the situation where we do not have a uh, defined ending. In that situation, a workflow is more a workflow execution is more like an um, an actor, a continuous presence. If you're familiar with Erlang, Elixir, Akka, or Leans, you already know the concept of an of an actor. So the workflow basically loops forever, waiting for uh, waiting for um, conditions, and one of these conditions is input. 
So in order to communicate with your workflow, you have the possibility to send the workflow signals. So the workflow then reacts to the signals, or if you do not need to poke your workflow and give input, but you just want to request some information from the workflow uh, execution, you also have the possibility of queries. So then you uh, send a query to get uh, a response from the workflow about its current state. Just to give an example, uh, you can, for example, have a workflow which has an activity which returns the type of next activity to run. And then you just say, get a next activity and then like execute activity by name. And you can have a loop doing that, right? So practically this workflow will practically pick next activity dynamically every time from the previous one. So you absolutely can have very dynamic workflow uh, based on whatever input you want. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Okay, no more question. I'm all bummed that I can't send out my form, but uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I just uh, created on my uh, uh, private Gmail account and then send it out later to your uh, to your email that you signed up with. I I, I hope you don't mind. Um, and then uh, of course feel free to feel feel free to ignore. It. Just two questions. Okay, that was a wonderful session. Anything else uh, to tell people about the next session, Dominic? We have uh, one more session coming up. And uh, in that session, it is again called an introduction to temporal, but um, there, there will be actually, so this uh, introduction to temporal architecture highlighted the concepts and uh, already um, um, gave, a, gave a little bit of an overflow of an overview how replay uh, works. For the next one, we will dive deep into the, into the um, mechanics of temporal and actually look at the temporal event loop and look at the replay in detail. So uh, even if you um, uh, attended this session, next session may also be worth it. But of course, um, all of the sessions uh, will be uh, recorded and um, let me share my, my screen one more time real quick. This is, this is where we see the form. Uh, there will be two questions, your experience with temporal and if this presentation was worth your time. But I also want to point you to uh, our temporal Slack. So if you have not signed up uh, to our Slack yet, um, please go ahead, sign up. And if you want to uh, brainstorm about temporal and how temporal fits your own use case, you can send me a DM in Slack and then we schedule a Zoom call. And also the yeah, promotion, I have a newsletter, The Weekend Read, where uh, we read about distributed systems. Uh, this time, it's all about the two-phase commit protocol for anybody who wants some nerdy entertainment on the weekend. All right, that's it from my side. There is one more question. Oh, I did not see. I can probably answer. <laughs> uh, I didn't see it yet. Why the choice of goal length for building temporal? Oh, I see. Yes, that is that is yeah. That's a question for you. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, partially historical because a, a tuber uh, goal length was a supported language, and uh, the other choices were Java and Python, and uh, goal length looked, uh, I think. Uh, just, um, I think we, we just like it for infrastructural software, but I think it was a good choice. I personally like Golang because it's very simple and you probably can get a developer which doesn't know Golang and in a few weeks he can write a production code. Certain, and uh, it gives you good uh, kind of, mm, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good compromise, right? It's certainly not perfect language or not perfect languages, but mm -hmm. between simplicity and power and uh, like multi-threading and support uh, and go routines, I think it's uh, just a good compromise. And I think we, we don't regret that. I think we still think that uh, given that uh, temporal is almost always uh, uh, limited by performance of temporal, almost always limited by a database, 
uh, go, uh, so optimizing it, it more didn't make sense. For example, if you rewrite temporal something like Rust to C++, you won't get much benefit because still uh, majority of the time will be spent on uh, the database. .NET SDK. Yes, we actually right now started the design phase of the .NET SDK. We have a developer full time on that. So uh, watch watch the proposals repo, temporal uh, slash proposals repo, and we will publish the first public proposal there probably pretty soon. In general, I recommend watching proposals repo. The uh, most of the non-trivial changes to the temporal itself and SDKs are published there, and you can comment there obviously and participate. Okay, if um, no one else has any other questions, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much, Dominic, for a great presentation. And thanks, Max, for dropping by and answering questions as well. Um, if anyone else has questions, um, you can also do what Dominic said, <laughs> join on Slack and also see you at the next and temporal give me just session. one second, I recreated, I recreated. Oh, you already did it? My uh, own. Nice, nice, nice. Hey, okay, we drop it here. So we may, okay, it was, Hello, quick copy paste. I hope this one. All works. right. Um, yeah, feedback form is in the chat. Um, appreciate if you could fill that out. And thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Dominic.